بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبا القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره We talked about the verse number 25. And then we just started the verse number 26. I would have been a shaitan or a dream. Let Lord him off a thamawat of the earth. In the Before I start explaining this ayah. There are several, uh, several concepts that we should get familiar. First of all, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only creator in this world. And I mean by creation, creation in its real sense. And that is to create something without having any material, without having anything there, creating from nothing. Okay? Because sometimes, you know, we have some material and then we give a form to that material and we call this creation. For example, we say, I have created this table. I have created this painting. Or Prophet Isa alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, remember when you created out of clay something like a bird. Okay? Then you blow into it and it becomes a bird. This was one of the miracles of Prophet Isa. But this is not creation in the real sense. This is, or I could say it's creation in the general sense, in the broad sense. So, in its real sense, it's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the creator. And this is a concept which is shared by other Abrahamic faith. And they call it in Latin creation ex nihilo, means creation from nothing. So, if you see that in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, after mentioning creation of human beings and then giving a new creation to it, which refers to the creation of soul. So, man then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fatabarakallah ahsanul khalaqeen. May be blessed the one who is the best creators, best among creators. That is in general sense. Otherwise, Allah is the only creator. Okay? So, whatever happens in this world, Whatever exists in this world is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So, naturally, the result would be that everything in this world would belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if everything is created by Allah, then it must belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not possible that Allah creates something. And then someone else comes and says, this is something belonging to me. Moreover, we don't have anything, anyone, any person, anything other than Allah and his creatures. This, this is the second problem. So first of all, everything is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no one can claim that this belongs to me. And secondly, we don't have anyone other than Allah and his creatures. Okay. So, it's very clear that everything in this world belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything receives its being and existence from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever it has, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Allah is its Lord. Rabb. Okay? Allah is their Lord for that thing. And this is why we say in the Quran 
that Allah is the only Lord. La Rabba Sewa. There is no Lord except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Either in the Quran or you know, similar statements or in hadith or in du'as. Concepts like this. Okay. Now, when we have this ayah in the Quran which says, لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs whatever is there in skies and in earth. It means that there is nothing in the whole world. Of course, directly this ayah may refer to the skies and earth. But we know that this is something which is applicable to whole world. Whatever is there in the world, whatever is there in the universe, physical or supernatural, all belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because he is the one who has created them. So now you re realize the relation between this ayah and the preceding ayah. وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ So if Allah has created the skies and the earth, so whatever is there in the skies and the earth belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is it clear? There is very clear logic here. Okay. What would be the result? Why Allah emphasizes on this? لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ There are different reasons for that. Maybe one of the reasons this is this. That this is to remind us that although we are able to use the gifts which exist in this world, in the skies and heaven, we use plants, animals, we grow, you know, for example, food, we do farming, we do, you know, whatever we want, industry, whatsoever. It's, in a real sense, something that, that we are doing in the property of someone else. You know, we are like a guest who is in the house of someone or in the farm of someone as a guest. But the landlord, the owner of that farm or that you know, house or whatsoever is so kind that says, although you are a guest, but you can do you know, whatever you want for your benefit. Okay? It's not something which is owned by us. This is the difference. It may look very simple, but this is one of the big differences between Islamic view and the Western view. Of course, I mean non-religious people in the West. The mentality of the West or Western people is that everything in this world belongs to us. As if we own them and we can do whatever we want with them. If we want to damage the nature, then damage the environment, no problem. Yes, if in the end it harms us, then there may be some worries. Although it's still, you know, even they may not pay attention to this. As you know what happens, you know, in these treaties about environment. So some of big countries, because it's not to the benefit, their economical benefit, they don't sign these treaties to protect, you know, the environment or, you know, the air or whatsoever. But even, you know, if pay attention, the reason is that because they say it would be harmful in the end for us or for forthcoming generations. This is the concept. This, everything belongs to us. Okay? Even if they can somehow get resources from the moon or Mars, no problem. They say this belongs to us. But our concept is different. We don't say these belong to us. We say these are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we can get benefit from them. Allah has made them subservient. Allah has made them in the way that we can get benefit from them. 
Okay? But they belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the result is that I, am, I can only treat them in the way that Allah is pleased with. Because he's the real owner. If the host, if the landlord gives me permission to do something in the house or in the farm or in the city for my benefit, I must not violate the will of that owner. I must not do something which makes that person unhappy. Okay? This is very important. Even my own belongings are not really my belongings. For example, my life. Is it really something that I own? Do you own your life? If you own it, so no one should be able to take it away from you. If you own something, if something really belongs to you, so no one must be able to take it away from you. And no one must be able to give it to you. The fact that you receive and it can be taken away means that you don't own it. You just have it. Like a book I give to you and you use this book. You have this book, okay? In the sense that you can use it, but you don't own it. It doesn't belong to you. I can take it away from you. Okay? So we believe that Allah is the giver of the life. And Allah is the one who takes away the life from us. Okay? So, in Islamic view, you cannot commit suicide. Suicide is haram. It's a murder, like killing another person. There is no difference between killing yourself or killing an innocent person. It's the same. But in the Western mentality, I mean non-religious people and the majority of the, you know, I, I mean in the secular or materialist point of view, there is no problem in committing suicide. There is no problem in euthanasia. If you are, you know, suffering, you have pain, okay, you can peacefully, you know, kill yourself or ask the doctor, you know, to be merciful enough to kill you, as they call it. But in Islamic view, we cannot do this. Or abortion. Can a father and mother say, this embryo belongs to us, we have given it a life and we can take away, so we can abort the embryo? No. Because this belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us able to do certain, you know, uh, alterations, changes, increase or decrease, different things in this world, but provided that we observe the guidelines, the instructions. If you go, for example, to one of national parks, you can enjoy yourself, but you must observe guidelines. You cannot do something to damage the national park or the animals which exist there or to endanger yourself or children. Okay? So this is very important difference and this is also one of the key principles in understanding Islamic environmental ethics. Okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِلَّهِ مَا فِي wal earth." Whatever is there in the skies and in the earth belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not, you know, some exaggeration or, you know, some metaphoric way of saying something. No, this is really, in real sense, everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in real sense, nothing belongs to us. Because whatever I have, my very existence, everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْغَنِيُّ الْحَمِيدُ Truly, verily, Allah is the rich. Allah is the one who is the rich 
and the praised. We have two attributes here. Al Ghani, Al Hamid. And the style is very important. In Allah, Huwa Al Ghani, Al Hamid. You could easily say Allahu Ghani, Al Hamidun. Means Allah is rich, Allah is praised. But there are lots of emphasis here. In Allah, so using Enna, which means truly. And then Al Ghani and with Zamir Fasl, it means verily Allah is the one who is the rich. Not just Allah is rich. Allah is the one who is the rich, who is the praised. Okay? Because in Arabic, these make lots of differences. Someone asked one of, to encourage you to learn Arabic a bit, little bit, someone asked one of masters of Arabic, uh, what is the difference between saying Zaydun Qa'imun and Enna Zaydan Qa'imun and Enna Zaydan La Qa'imun? Basically, all these three sentences say that Zayd is standing. Okay? Zayd is the name of a person. But what is the difference between saying Zaydun Qa'imun, Enna Zaydan Qa'imun, and Enna Zaydan La Qa'imun? Do you know what is the difference? Yes. With the, the last one is with the great emphasis. It's not exclusive. None of them is exclusive. But with the greatest emphasis. Yeah. So he's, he put it in a very beautiful way. He said, when you speak with someone who has no idea whether Zaid is standing or not, so his mind is clear, empty. Okay? So you say Zaidun Qa'imun. Which means that Zaid is standing. His mind is empty, so there is no need to emphasize. Okay? When do you use emphasis? When there is a need for that. When someone has doubt. So if someone has clear mind, empty mind, so you say, Zaydun Qa'im. If someone has doubt whether Zayd is standing or not, so it means he is already familiar with this question, he has this in mind, but he didn't have the answer. So here you put a little bit emphasis. You say, Enna Zaydan Qa'imun. Okay? And if that person denies that Zayd is standing, so it's more than doubt. He denies. So you say, Enna Zaydan La Qa'imun. See how beautiful and accurate is Arabic. Okay? But you don't find many of these points in translations, unfortunately. You know, none of these translations can fully convey the message of the Quran. Okay. Here we have in Allah huwa al Hamid. And because here we have Zamir al Fasl and the, uh, also attributes al Ghani and al Hamid are with Alif and Lam, shows also exclusiveness. So there's also emphasis and exclusiveness. So it's very a strong way of expression. Truly, Allah is the only one who is the rich and the praised. Why Allah puts so much emphasis on this? Maybe because some people deny that. Not maybe in theory, but in practice. If I really believe that Allah is the rich, so I should not have any fear when I am with Allah. When Allah has promised to support the people who support his religion, so I shouldn't feel any fear. Allah defends those who believe. If you 
help Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will help you and assist you. So if I believe that Allah is the rich, he has everything in his hand. So I should have no fear. Many of the people, because of temptations of the Satan, have fear of poverty. This is what Quran says. Ash-shaytan ya'idukumul faqr. Satan always, you know, is here in just putting in our ears that you will become poor. When you grow up, when you become old, when you, your children, you know, left, leave you, you become poor. When the economic, you know, situation changes, you will become poor. Always in different ways, tries to convince us that there is a real danger of becoming poor. But a moment has no fear. A moment does his best or her best and then leaves everything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no fear. So some people in theory deny that Allah is the rich. Some people in practice show that they not fully grasp and fully accept that Allah is the rich. So this is why there is this emphasis. And I don't know if you are familiar with uh, the concept of poverty. Uh, sometimes uh, in London and also in Dar es Salaam, I talked about this uh, spiritual poverty. And this is very re related to this concept of richness. I believe that one of the very important principles of Islamic spirituality is poverty. And then to explain that, I usually mention uh, four different meanings of poverty. But the one which is now you know, relevant to us is a spiritual poverty. So there are three other meanings. And I mean by a spiritual poverty to feel your entire dependence on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To feel that you are nothing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To get rid of all selfishness, self-interest, and coming out of your own shelters and barriers, whatever makes you separate from other creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by doing so, you will become so strong and so powerful that everything will become under your control. As long as I say, me and you, my interests and your interests, I am limited. But if I get rid of my selfishness, then your interests will be my interests. So whatever you do for yourself, you are doing for me as well. Whatever everyone is doing for himself or herself is doing for me as well. So you go so high in the creation that nothing will make you deprived or will make you, you know, for example, poor or will make you unhappy or whatsoever. It's a very uh, important concept. Unfortunately, we are so much focused our own on our own, you know, limited being and limited existence, limited, you know, interest. And our minds are so, you know, closed that only we think about the things that directly and immediately relate to us. And sometimes, you know, we feel also jealous, you know, about other people whatsoever. Or I say, for example, this is my Islamic center, that is your Islamic center. I must do something, you know, to bring you down. Or I must at least do something to you know, promote our center so that you go down. If I don't you know, bring you down, at least by making ourselves better, we want to make you second. This is my marja, this is your marja. Different, different ways of you know, competition and rivalries that you find among religious people. I'm not talking about you know, bad people who kill each other or, you know, for example, do corruption, you know, to destroy their competitors. Even religious people, unfortunately, 
We are sometimes so close-minded that we do these things in the name of Allah. I think, for example, by promoting, for example, my marja and bringing your marja down, I am doing some services. This is nonsense. And sometimes, you know, people don't realize that they are not doing any service to these people. This is just serving their own selfishness. You may have heard that once two people, and in many cases, you know, those ulama themselves have no problem. It's their, you know, assistants or followers or houses, you know, that they have this problem. So once two people had in a small city had dispute, Everyone was supporting his own alim. This one was say that my alim is very good. And that one said my alim is even better. Their knowledge, piety, so they were disputing. So one of them told, but your own alim himself admits that our alim is better. He's more knowledgeable. He himself says that. Do you know what he said? He said, he's stupid. He doesn't understand that he's better. <laughs> so this is the mentality. So if he's so stupid, so why you promote him? So he wants to say, indeed, that he's stupid because he said something right. He's stupid because he didn't, you know, agree with me. So indeed, these people are promoting themselves, not promoting Islam or, you know, Maraje or, you know, Islamic centers. They just want to promote themselves. And when they find their interest in another place, then they move to another place, to another direction. Today they are with you, tomorrow they are against you. So we must get rid of all this selfishness. And the best time for this is when you are young. Because when you grow up, you become, you know, known in the society, respected, then it would be very difficult. Because everyone will be very careful about what you say, what you do, whether you go to that place or you don't go. And then it would be very difficult. But when you are very young, your heart is, you know, soft and pure, and you don't have that much, you know, attachment to the to the world, it is much easier. So, this is the advice which is usually given by our ulama, that you must do this when you are young. This is the same about for talabas, for religious students. They cannot, you know, start practicing this when they become ayatollah. That's too late. If from the very beginning, when they are a small student, small talabe, they do it, then inshallah when they become ayatollah, they have this quality. So this is very important. There is a sentence, a statement from Shahid Qudusi, Ayatollah Qudusi, who is the one who, for the first time with the support of Shahid Beheshti and others, established uh, schools for boys and girls with full program, full curriculum, which later, you know, uh, with other schools became Jama'at al-Zahra for girls and for boys became Madrasa Shahide. So he, in one of his, uh, you know, sermons about akhlaq preaching, he said that before you talaba, before you establish yourself, Become, before you become famous, before people come to know you, you must look after your hearts. If you don't look after your heart at this stage, then later you will never be able to do that. So it's very important that when we are young, you know, we take this opportunity to look after ourselves and to promote this concept of poverty, that I am nothing. Everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I am his servant. You see, every time we pray, we say our prayer, 
we focus on this, that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was his servant and his messenger. Why? Have you ever thought about this? Why we say, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu? Sometimes once in two rak a prayers and in the rest two times. Why? Can anyone explain? Yes. But we could say, Ashadu anna Muhammadan insanun. Why we say, Abduhu? Or, Ashadu anna Muhammadan basharun. Qul anna ma ana basharun mithlukum. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, yeah, you are both correct. And this is my personal understanding. I, I'm not saying that this is definitely true. But I think when we say the Prophet was his servant, of course, this automatically rejects the idea of believing a sort of divinity for the Prophet. But it is also even more than that. It means that the Prophet was first a servant of Allah and then he was chosen as a messenger. So he achieved servitude and he was given the position of being a messenger. In other words, to be able to be a messenger of Allah, you must be first a servant of Allah. Servant in real sense. Of course, all human beings are servants of Allah. But when we say he was servant of Allah, it means that he was real servant of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone who knew that he is a servant of Allah. Because many people think that they are free. They are not servants. They feel that they are free. So it is very important that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so humble, was so humble that never anyone, have you ever noticed this point? But don't get me wrong, you know, when I emphasize on the humbleness of the Prophet, don't take it as negation of humbleness of, you know, other people that I'm going to mention. But the Prophet was so humble that no one never thought that he is a Lord. He is God. No, no one ever had the chance to exaggerate about Jesus, this happened. About imams also this happened. Yeah? About imams. Some people exaggerated, you know, for example, about Imam Ali or about other imams. I am not saying that these were not humble, you know, don't take me wrong. But I am saying that the Prophet was the archetype of humbleness. And the second sign for this is that you very rarely find miracles happening next to the grave of the Prophet. There are different reasons for that. One is this, and the other is that, because there are several other graves also there, so people you know, may make you know, stories of it. But this is also one reason, that the Prophet in no way did something that people may could mistakenly take it as a sign of being someone next to Allah. So I believe that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was the most humble person in the whole creation. And this is another dimension of Ashhadu Anna Muhammadan Abduhu wa Rasuluh. And our Imams were proud of being 
in the line of the Prophet, followers of the Prophet. You know that Imam Ali alayhi salam said, Ana abdun min abid Muhammad. I am a servant of Muhammad. They were proud of being a servant of Muhammad. Imam Ali is proud of being brought up by the Prophet. You know, in Nahj al Imam Ali explains that when he was very young, the Prophet was feeding him and sometimes putting food in his mouth and making it soft and putting it in the mouth of Imam Ali. So they are proud of their relation with the Prophet. Okay? Of course, this is my idea. I'm not saying this is necessarily true. You may think about it and accept it or reject it. But I have this firm belief that the Prophet was the most humble person to the extent that left no chance for anyone to have wrongly or mistakenly any idea about his divinity. So, إِنَّ Allah هُوَ الْغَنِيِّ So by emphasizing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's richness and that He is the only one who is rich, we first of all must realize that we ourselves are not rich, we are poor. And that, secondly, that everyone else is also poor. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ أَنْتُمُ الْفُقَرَاءُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ هُوَ الْغَنِيُّ الْحَمِيدُ Very beautiful ayah. O oh people, you are all poor and in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You all need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is the only one who is the rich and the praised. أَنْتُمُ الْفُقَرَاءُ إِلَى اللَّهِ But many people don't realize this poverty. And Imam Hussein alayhi salam in Dua Arafah has a very important statement. Think about it and tomorrow inshallah you will let me know what was your idea about this hadith, this Dua. This is my last point here. Allahumma إني أتوصل إليك بفقري وكيف أتوصل إليك بما هو محال أن يصل إليك. This is in Dua Arafah. You can find it in Mafati or write it. It means, my Lord, I appeal to you. أتوصل إليك. You know the meaning of تواصل. Means to find some means to get closer or to ask for some. I appeal to you with my poverty. Atavassalu ilayka bifagri. Wa kaifa atavassalu ilayka. And how can I appeal to you with something will never reach you? Can poverty reach Allah? No. Poverty never reaches Allah because Allah is the rich. So, you're, so the things that you are using for tawassul must be able to reach Allah, but this doesn't reach. So think about it and inshallah tomorrow or the next teaching day, inshallah we will uh, review. Pardon? Du'ai Arafah. This is Du'ai Arafah of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. In Arabic, my Lord, I appeal to you with my poverty. And how is it possible to appeal to you with something which is impossible to reach you? So, inshallah, you reflect about this and inshallah we will continue uh, about the rest of ayah. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen.